Welcome to the Unpacking It podcast with Bryce Johnson. It's a show that unpacks sports, faith, and life with intriguing guests from the sports and entertainment world. Enjoy inspiring conversations and thought-provoking interviews. You'll hear stories from people that will inspire, challenge, and encourage you. Now, from the Unpacking It studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, uniting sports fans everywhere, here is Bryce Johnson. Welcome to the Unpacking It podcast. I'm Bryce Johnson. I am recording this, and you can hear thunder in the background. We've got some crazy weather here in Charlotte, but glad to be with you here on the Unpacking It podcast. And after this show, I uh, need to get home and be with my wife and daughter. Apparently, we've got some flooding issues going on. We've got part of the roof coming off. A tree fell on my horseshoe pit that I worked very hard on. So uh, a lot going on. But this is the show that unpacks sports, faith, and life with intriguing guests from the sports and entertainment world. And today's guest is two-time Super Bowl champion and former NFL kicker Matt Stover. He's in the Baltimore Ravens ring of honor. He spent time with the Browns and the Giants and the Colts. We'll ask about his Super Bowl experiences and get his thoughts on this past Super Bowl with the Chiefs winning it all. Uh, also, uh, man, he he has this new organization that he started uh, kind of after he retired, and it's called the Players Philanthropy Fund, and it's a, a donor-advised fund to facilitate charitable giving for professional athletes. And, and so I just I found what he created very interesting, and so I'll ask him a lot about it, and, and hopefully it's interesting to you as well, and, and hopefully you're someone that is a giver, you're, you're a donor to, to ministries, to church, to your church. Uh, hopefully you're a donor to unpacking it. Uh, but also I think it's so important for you know athletes, especially when they, they make so much money, what they end up doing with it. But also what do they do with their own platform and their name and likeness, whether they're playing or afterward, to leverage raising funds for specific causes and, and charitable efforts. And, and not just raising money to raise money because they can, but actually using that money to make a big impact on many of the communities that they grew up in, but also the communities that they settle in, maybe where they played. You know, Matt Stover ended up settling in Baltimore after his playing days. So a, a lot to get into with Matt Stover. He, he's the vice president and co-founder of the Players Philanthropy Fund. And, and so we'll discuss that and then incredible faith story you'll hear about as well and, and just a, a great heart for the Lord. And, and stick around at the end of our interview with him. Uh, one thing stood out to me that was a challenge and an encouragement to myself, and I think it can be to you as well. But before we do that, let's jump right in. Here is Matt Stover on the Unpacking It podcast. Intriguing guests and inspiring conversations. This is Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson. And right now, we are joined by Matt Stover. Matt, thanks so much for being with us here on Unpacking It. How are you? Hey, Bryce. Thanks for having me on, man. Blessed to be here. All right. Well, we're, we're fired up to, to talk with you, and, and it's fun talking with you a couple days after the most recent Super Bowl, because you, of course, uh, won two Super Bowls, one with the Giants and, and one with the Ravens. And, and so before we talk about this year's Super Bowl, as you look back and, and you know, this time of year, you think back to your time in the Super Bowl, what are some of the memories that, that flood your mind? Well, I'll tell you, try, to be there in the game in the first place is just incredibly hard to do. In the NFL, it is really easy to lose. Mm. Yep. <laughs> it's so easy to lose in the NFL. I mean, I played 20 years, lost a lot of games, won a lot of games, and it's really hard to win. Mm. And it's extremely hard to win. So you can't equate the two the same. You can't. So uh, to, to be in the Super Bowl, to be in the game, the fact that you got there, says a lot about your team and the effort that you put into it and, and the role that you had. Even as a kicker, the Super Bowl you know, 25, that was a huge role for the kicker. And Super Bowl 35, when I was there with the Ravens, 
um, we had five games without a touchdown. <laughs> and we won three of those games because I kicked a lot of field goals. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, that type of um, uh, thinking through it and what it takes to get there. And then when you are there to win it, because mm. I lost the Super Bowl my last game of my career is when I played in Super Bowl 44 with the Indianapolis Colts. Peyton Manning was there. And uh, Adam Vinatieri had gotten hurt, and I stepped in and kicked really well. And uh, we got uh, into the Super Bowl 44 in Miami versus uh, the New Orleans Saints, and we were beat. Uh, so I, I have experienced both sides of that game. Yeah, so, so what was the, the loss like? Especially, I, I just think about the players in the locker room, the ride home, the following days. What was that experience from your perspective? Well, you better have a great foundation underneath you. You better know who you are. Because <laughs> if, you, if, you, if your identity is all wrapped up in this game, you're going to find yourself uh, depressed majorly, even though I was upset and I played a part in it and missed a field goal. Um, but, I, you know, I had a greater cause, greater purpose than just, you know, winning or losing a game. So I was able to internalize that and get through the game, even though it was, it was emotionally tough. And it, it's brutal, man, because they throw up those ropes right in front of your <laughs> bench if you don't win. And you can't get out to the field. Wow. You're done. You're, you're shipped off. And you, the only way to you to walk is to the locker room. <laughs> oh, my god! So you walk to the locker room, and it's not good. And that was the last game I ever played. And I knew that at the end of the game, that was it. Oh, you, I was going to call it a career. You knew that going into that game or in that moment? Yeah, I knew it. It was like, I'm over. And uh, so when I'm taking off my pads, you know, I had the loss – you know, that I'm dealing with in the, in the role that I played in that loss, I had the reality that a 20 year career was over. So you can only imagine where my emotions were. Mm. And, um, you know, it was a unique situation for me to experience that. But I, my goal was, was to help another team win mm. and get to the Super Bowl. Uh, and, and if we didn't win, I didn't, that wasn't the purpose. I wanted to help that team get there. And we did. But, you know, it, it came down to when I was in the bus uh, on the way home, uh, excuse me, on the way to the hotel after the game. And, Bryce, uh, I had about 53 different uh, texts from my buddies, and they were all saying, hey, Stove, Stove, you wouldn't believe what, what happened. I said, what, what? You know, and they said, Jim Nance mentioned that you were a godly man oh. and that, you know, after you missed that field goal, you pointed up. Wow. And uh, everybody saw it. I said, What? And immediately I understood what my true purpose was. It was never about me. It was about God. And I have a relationship with Christ and, and, and what that looks like. And, you know, that was the greater purpose that I was talking about. And, and how did it come to fruition? And it really gave me a sense of peace afterwards. Oh, that, that's an awesome story. And, and even thinking, too, uh, Jim Caldwell was the head coach of the Colts at the time, right? Oh, yeah. And so, oh, yeah. I love the man. Uh, yeah. And he's a, another wonderful man of faith, has been on the show as, as well. What was his message? Do you happen to remember in the locker room following the game? Because he would be similar to you in that having the right perspective on it. Well, he, he was calmed at spirit because of it. Um, he was upset like everybody and emotionally distressed. <laughs> Who wouldn't be, right? But he, he was proud of us. Mm. And there's no reason to hang your head. Of course, you've heard that a thousand times. But he meant it sincerely. And he understood how hard it was just to get to the game. And the fact that we just didn't execute as well as we needed to, the other team did, we got beat. There was no excuses. So he, he also looked at each one of us and, and, and said that everybody here is a winner. Everybody here is successful. And you couldn't be more proud of him, you know, of, of him and then of us. And he was just a, a guy who had also had a transcendent cause. It wasn't just about the game to him. That's right. No, I, I love Jim Caldwell for sure. Well, uh, yeah, I hate to dwell on the on the loss because you, you won two Super Bowls as well. But, oh, we're good. But I think it's a yeah, just an interesting uh, perspective. And so we're we're a couple of days away from this year's Super Bowl. I know you were down there uh, at least for for part of the the week. What was the experience like uh, being a, a part of the festivities, and what was your role down there this week? <laughs> well, Miami's kind of crazy to say the least. Uh, <laughs> there's a between South Beach and downtown Miami. <laughs> wow. It was a lot going on, but they did a great job of hosting. The city did a great job. And, of course, a lot of the festivities are up in Fort Lauderdale area and Hollywood uh, Beach and all that. So, you know, I was jumping all around to networking events. Uh, I'm running the Players Philanthropy Fund. We have over 160 accounts, and most of the accounts are athletes and celebrities. And instead of them having their own private foundation, they just plug into the Players Philanthropy Fund, and uh, they then have their foundation. We do all the back office work. So 
I'm out there talking with agents, financial advisors, lots of athletes that come in, uh, rappers to rock stars as well, because they all come in as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity for me to uh, hit a lot of people all at one time. So I choose that Super Bowl as a, as a great venue for me to uh, to really promote what I've been doing here for the last nine years. Yeah, well, yeah, I want, I want to talk more about this because I'm, I'm fascinated by it as someone in, in the ministry world and nonprofit world. I, I understand a, a glimpse of it, but but I'm always fascinated because players, you know, oftentimes they want to give and but they but they also find value in having their own foundation and so what is kind of the the thought process behind you explaining what you make available to them but then also just kind of the the whole scope of players make a lot of money they want to give it but they want to do it wisely and and structurally set up well so normally what do guys do with the foundations and then and then how did you kind of make it even easier for them (laughs) well you just nailed it Bryce thank you man that was a great question You, you said a lot there and it's truly the heart behind it. It's to protect the player, the uh, the celebrity, and the individuals who don't really truly understand the compliance and the business side of a nonprofit. It's a 501c3. We're a donor advice fund that set up fiscal sponsorship contracts with others that allows them to operate as if they have their own. So instead of the athlete having the fiduciary responsibility to do all the tax receipts, to do all the tax returns, to you know, the, the, the 990 and having all this together uh, and, and following all the receipts and all the logistics of, of the money, we have taken that responsibility over for them. And they are actually parked inside of the Players Philanthropy Fund, and we give them that 501c3 status. And uh, they are allowed to do it based on our approval and and our best practice teachings and how our protocols. And that what it does is it protects the athlete or the individual uh, to make sure that they're not going to corrupt their brand, that they're actually going to do it right. Mm. So a lot of athletes like to pay their family members to Ooh. be on their staff. And it's totally legal, um, and you can do that, but there's best practices parked inside of that. And what does that look like with the amount of money that you're raising? And if you're getting grants from other teams or other or, you know, corporate sponsors and they want to make sure that your money is being spent towards the cause that you're saying you're supporting. So that is our job as a player's philanthropy fund to make sure that that is being done according to what is best practice in philanthropy. So we have all those measures. It's explained up front. A lot of agents and financial advisors love us because cool. a lot of times they're put in the middle of these things. They're on their board or they're having to say no. And then it puts pressure on their relationship with them. They don't want to lose a client. So they partner with us. And uh, we're able to allow the, the, the financial advisor or the agent to be uh, on the account as an account administrator, and they can help direct where the funds go. So everything's out in the open, and we're held accountable. The PPF is to make sure that everything's done d- doing according to their wishes as well. Uh, that, that's awesome. And, and ultimately, it's, it's allowing more impact to happen and, and more great yep. causes and impacting communities and, and all that sort of thing, which is, which is cool. And, well, that's exactly yeah, it, ahead. Bryce, and not to interrupt, because if you think about uh, what happens if those funds aren't managed well, if they're not brought in properly, if they're not spent properly, less you know, less uh, money is going into the cause, into the program, or, or into the, a hardship case, or whether or not it's through paying for the Boys and Girls Club to go to a movie or or to put coats on their backs, you know, to give them book bags. We can come around them and pay those hard invoices and hold them accountable. Um, somebody's having an event, and we see that the contract is going to be ripping off the, in, the the player because the event's going to cost them too much. We're going to say, what are you paying for? Wow. And absolutely not. We're not going to allow you to do that. And therefore, we hold them, all of the people whom they're in business with as well, accountable. Wow. That's awesome. Well, so do you encourage – like all players to have their own fund or do you encourage some of them just to, to donate to the overall fund or, or what's kind of your perspective on that? Well, there's a lot of different ways of an athlete to get involved in charitable giving. If it's their own funds, a lot of times they just want to give to another 501c3 and call it a day, you know, the boys and girls club or United way or whatever. But if they actually want to do the work where mm. they're going to use their brand To raise the funds, Mm. I would highly suggest them going through a fiscal sponsor like like the Players Philanthropy Fund 
and people who already understand the athlete and the athlete's family and the culture and how we deal with things. Uh, and, and then therefore everything's kept clean. If they already have their own 501 C three, they better have competent people around them, a good board, yep. a good accountant, a good bookkeeper, right? Those type of things that are necessary. And it becomes very cumbersome. We are the training wheels sometimes for athletes that want to have their own 501c3. They're waiting for the status to come through from the IRS for their charter, but they choose to go through us first. Well, a lot of times they find out how easy it is now through us and how awesome it is. They choose not even to use their 501c3 that they're creating. They said, we just want to stay here at PPF. And they can brand it whatever name they want it to. Mm. Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, uh, Dwayne Wade, Justin Thomas, any of these guys, gals that we represent, they can name and, and brand it whatever they want and, and get the credit for it. I love it. No, it's a, it's a great concept. Uh, it's called Players Philanthropy Fund. Uh, you can check that out online. And, and so, yeah, I'm curious, too, how, how did you end up starting this? You were one of the co-founders. <laughs> well, you know, Bryce, when you, when you look back at my career, I, I never thought that I would play 20 years, ever. Wow. I was always thinking and transitioning out of the NFL every single year that I played. I never depended on next year's salary. Hmm. If you do that and you find yourself out of the NFL, which happens at a moment, you're going to find yourself in financial stress. Uh, and distress. And, and when that happens, uh, you, you're reactive. I was always proactive, knowing that at one point I'm going to be done with this career. <laughs> yep. So I want to make sure that that was those steps were being made. So I interned my first few years in the NFL with the IMG, the International Management Group out of Cleveland, because I was with the Browns. And then once I get into um, my mid middle years, I had a couple kids and got real busy, but I took about four years off there and then dove right back into some entrepreneurship, built a couple companies, sold them and did real well and really learned how to give away money. Wow. And I utilized, yeah, right. I utilized a donor advised fund in order to do that. And I found out how simple it was, hmm. but they didn't cater to the athlete and to the athlete's needs. Like what I have discovered and created a very flexible model with a player's philanthropy fund. And we have actually partnered with them and let them do events and all different types of things through our platform. So that's how it started. And that's how we've come to this point now where we have over 160 accounts and we're the largest fiscal sponsor that's out there. Wow, yeah. that that's cool. Well, lo love hearing about that, and and cool that you were down in Miami, uh, a part of some of the the festivities and connecting with a lot of your uh, current and potential uh, partners, I guess, in in the fun. So uh, that's exactly what it is. Exactly, Bryce, and, and my hope is that. We double because uh, I have a great staff here and we're able to handle a lot. So thanks for all the questions. It really does mean a lot to me and, I, and, and, and your audience. And, and if you know anybody that's able to that needs the help or wants to start a foundation, you don't have to be an athlete. You can be anybody. Oh, and right. uh, we would love to be. Yeah, we'd love to partner with you. We have 40 percent of our accounts aren't even athletes and celebrities. So, well, no, cool, very cool. So, uh, yeah, Super Bowl a couple of days ago. What were your thoughts on the game and, and the fact that, that the Chiefs uh, are our new champions in the NFL? Well, I'll tell you what, for them to come back from behind like they did, so, so much character. The fact that they've done that time and time again, they did it at the AFC Championship. And, I, I, you know, that, that says a lot about Mahomes, says a lot about Andy Reid. So proud of them. You know, the Hunt family are super, super people. Mm. I'm so, so glad that they were able to do that. And uh, I tell you, that Chiefs Nation was something. That is a very difficult place to play. I will not mind to tell you. It is very <laughs> loud. I played there several times. So, you know, you know, overall, I would have picked the defense, the strongest defense. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you, that defense didn't play that well in the fourth quarter. No. Um, and they didn't shut the door. I know that the offense played really well, but, hey, great defense has got to stop them. And I will go with defense every single time. It just shows you San Francisco's defense was good, but they weren't as good as they thought they were. And that's why I believe that uh, Kansas City won. That, that's right. You know, you know about good defenses. Both those teams you're on, the Giants and the, the Ravens, were, were known yep. for. <laughs> great. That's exactly right. Great defenses. <laughs> well, so uh, in, I know in the, the Ravens Super Bowl when you guys won, I mean, you blew out the Giants. That game was over by halftime. I remember I was in middle school. We went out and played basketball and. I'm not sure we went back. Do you know in. what the score was? Do you know what the score was at halftime? What, what was it? Ten to nothing. Oh, is that all it was? That game was the over. Game was, the game was over. Over. They were not going to score twice on us. <laughs> and they came. If you remember, they scored the opening touchdown on a kickoff return, right? 
Oh. And then the very next play was a kickoff to us, and we returned it for a touchdown. Game over. <laughs> game, game over. I, yeah, I remember, I remember the Super Bowl party I was at and all that as a, as a middle schooler playing basketball and thinking, man, Ravens got this in the bag. But, but, but I'm yep. just curious, as a kicker, when you're playing in Super Bowls, are you rooting for a big kick? Do you, do you want that, that moment, or is that something you go, ah, if it happens, it happens, but, but I'm not necessarily wanting for the, the, for the game to be on the line for me to go out there and kick a game-winning kick? Now, what it is, it's an embracement of, the, of the being in that position for the team, mm. whether it's first quarter or fourth quarter. You're embracing the fact that you're going to take a huge effect in the game. Because think about that game. Usually it's not 34 to 7 like we beat the uh, Giants. It's usually pretty close, like it was this past you know weekend. True. Um, so, but you do envision that kick every single game. When Adam Vinatieri went out there, who's a friend of mine, went out there and kicked those field goals and to win the game in the Super Bowl, he had already envisioned them. Mm-hmm. He had already known that they were coming. So you embrace every kick, and then you embrace the fact that the game's going to come down to you. Wanting it is one thing. You're saying, I want to get it. Give it to me. Give it to me. Instead of saying, well, you don't have any control over that. Mm. So just, hey, be ready for it if it comes. That's what I mean by embracing it. I love it. That's great philosophy for life. So that's a, that's a wonderful perspective. Well, Take it as it comes, man, <laughs> and be ready for it, right? That, that's it. <laughs> that's strong. Well, well let, let's, you, you mentioned your faith a little bit uh, early on in, in talking about you know, dealing with a, a Super Bowl, Bowl loss, uh, but would love to know what was the turning point in your life where you ultimately decided to follow Jesus? What, what led to that? Well, the success of my career was so empty. Uh, I got into the league in 1990, won a Super Bowl, um, and then 1991, I had a really hard year. Um, it was Belichick, uh, first year as a uh, Brown, and it was just crazy hard. And I had so much identity into this career. I had been newly married, and uh, that's tough. You know, relationships in your life are the toughest thing you got to deal with. And so I was, you know, struggling there, struggling on the field, and then I missed a 19-yard field goal. 19 yard field goal to beat the Houston Oilers. How about that one? Oh, man. And um, yeah, that's how old I am. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I go down on my knee and I said, Lord, help me. Mm-hmm. And I had gone to church my whole career, you know, my whole life and uh, grew up in the Greek church and really loved, knew who Jesus was and, and loved the church, but really didn't have a, a true understanding of Christ in my life on an every moment basis and being filled with the Spirit and being mm-hmm. led by the Spirit. You know, I was kind of an open door closed door policy with God. And I'm sure you've heard that where you, Hey, when you need him, you open the door. When you don't need him out, oh, you know, God, you know, go away. I'm going to go do my thing now. And then show back up on Sunday. Mm. Um, so I really didn't have that, uh, deep, tender, um, relationship, personal relationship. That's that I feel like is, is, uh, really brings out the fruits of the spirits, you know? Uh, so I, I, at that point I go down on my knee and then finally God had prepared my heart to really understand and hear the gospel for the first time. Mm-hmm. And my wife, who was, uh, uh she was a uh, Christian since she was 12. Um, we went to a, uh, family conference for professional athletes called pro pro athletes outreach and phenomenal. And they, they still around today and they set up conferences very similar to like family life. And you go there and you just get fed by the word and you get fed to and, and giving tools on how to be married and how to have children and how to be a man and how to be a great woman, godly woman based on the word of God. So finally, uh, Ken Hutchison, who's recently passed, uh, preached it like none other. And I felt like I was the only one in the room and he talked about Mark eight, 34 and 35. So what good is it for man to gain the whole world yet for, his own soul. And I had the whole world think about it. The NFL, you got it all, man got it all and you should be happy you should be mm. joyful and was, why was i so miserable because my identity was all mixed up in it and it was very hard and it was very empty uh so as it turned out i surrendered my life right then and there in uh, february 1992 uh. and i don't mind to tell you um you know how you hear oh you know no dude i got caught i mean i was on fire let's uh, go uh, and awesome. you know and i i just i you know the, the privilege of being an nfl player bryce this is a long answer no but the great. privilege of being an nfl player gives you this it gives you access to great teachers, Hmm. to great men who want to invest in you and help you develop that platform for God's kingdom. And man, I had, I had the perfect person that the Browns got named Tom Petersburg athletes in action. He mentored me. He gave me the milk that I needed, some of the bread that I needed. By the time I got to the, uh, the, uh, 
uh, Baltimore Ravens in 1996, Joel Ehrman, who was a ex, you know, a retired defensive lineman from the Detroit Lions and, and the Indianapolis Colts. He's from Detroit, uh, uh, Indianapolis Colts. Just started giving me meat and just challenging me, telling me, "Hey, still over Christianity isn't about you. Uh, Come on, you know, yeah. one of those talks and yeah. just taught me how to be that that uh, spiritual man." And and then I got some other men around me, and next thing you know, I'm leading the Bible studies and and, and for the team and. You know, Deion Sanders comes in and I'm helping him and, you know, all different kinds of things are going on. And um, it, it's just a privilege to have have been exposed to that for so many years and then actually learning how to do it so that when my time came to be done, I could even use, learn, uh, use that ministry outside. Yeah, well, no, I lo- love the story and it's encouraging to hear. And, and so since retiring from the NFL, let, let's pick up there. How has your faith grown? And you mentioned wanting to you know, use it and pour into others. And, and what are some of the, the ways that you've been able to do that since then? Well, first and foremost, I was advised very strongly to make sure that your family's in order. Um, so my wife, my children, in 2010, you know, I had a, a ninth grader, a seventh grader and a five-year-old. So um, that well, it was a seven-year-old. So with that, I had a lot of uh, responsibilities, but I'm type A. I'm ready to go. Let's move to the next thing. You know, let's write a book. Let's go speak. Let's do commentating. Let's go. And I actually had to, you know, listen to my wife. <laughs> Imagine that, right? And I listened to her very strongly because she was chirping a little bit about being careful what how much I'm doing. Are you sure you want to do this? And so I actually saw counsel, and the counselor said, "Man, Matt, you want to make take a little time out and, and be careful with what you're doing uh, because I think that you need to get more focused on your family." He basically said, Matt, um, your wife doesn't want the big life anymore, buddy. Mm. You better back off and you better understand. And she meant so much to me mm. that I dropped it all. It was all gone. Wow. I got rid of the commentating. Uh, you know, I quit um, uh, trying to uh, write the book. That was done. What I did do, opportunities, of course, for Christ. And I developed another corporate type of speech based on, you know, my business experience, my on the field experience and off the field. What does that look like? But I did some of that. But since then, you know, I, we created the players philanthropy fund and, you know, generically grew it. And now that my youngest is 16, the other two, one's getting married. The other one's almost out of college, getting a master's things become a little bit easier. Now my wife's saying, get on out of here. Go, (laughs) you know, we, you're bothering me. Yeah. Uh, so God had pulled me back and he used my wife and others around me um, and to get more centered on what was priority. And you know what, Bryce, I have no regret, no regret for making that decision because now I can see that I did the best I could with my family. Who's number one in my life, of course, other than other than Christ. Amen. No, I, I love that. Well, so uh, who's getting married, son or daughter? So my daughter is Your she's daughter. 24, marrying a wonderful Christian man. Uh, they're going to be living in Philadelphia. He's got, he's going to be a dermatologist. So man, thank goodness we got a skin doctor in the family. <laughs> and, uh, and my son's playing professional lacrosse for the uh, premier lacrosse league. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And he's getting a master's. He went to Loyola university as a goalie in lacrosse. Those guys are nuts. Oh, crazy. Right. How about you, you and your kids? Tell me, you know, yeah. So I'm a new dad. So, uh, I've got a six month old daughter. At, at home. Wow, so. you're full on, man. Get ready. She's going to be married before you know it. That, oh, I know. And I, yeah, I'm already praying for her future husband. Start for sure. praying for her future husband. That's right. A- absolutely. And all of my kids know that I do that. I prayed with them a lot about their future. Because I, I always said, you know your wife. You know your husband's alive right now. Man. Let's pray for him, man. That's you know, right. Yours may not be. That's right. Yours still may be. Let's see. <laughs> but when you're when you're 16, I would hope that oh, she's yeah. alive. You know. Oh, that's that's neat. <laughs> well, are you uh, nervous about the the wedding? What are your thoughts on just your your is your oldest daughter getting getting married? Well, yeah, because of their centeredness around Christ, he's first in both of their lives. <laughs> man, you know, my hands up, man. Yeah. I'm just like, thank you. And that that those prayers were started before she was ever born, and my mother and father-in-law and, and all the people around us. So I'm at peace. I, I can't wait to walk her and give her away and say, man, buddy, I love you. I appreciate it. She's yours and she's expensive. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's good. Have you, have you picked out your uh, father daughter dance? Do you know? Oh that yeah. Yet? We've got it. Actually, we had it choreographed somewhat. Oh, that's uh, fancy. By, so we've kind of gotten together and we got to practice it. She's up in Philadelphia. So we've got some practice that we got to do. <laughs> oh, that, that's awesome. Um, 
Well, uh, you mentioned your son plays lacrosse. Did he ever consider getting into football or kicking, or, or how did he end up playing lacrosse? Both of my sons did, Bryce. Uh, Jacob, who's my 23-year-old, and Joe, who's my 16-year-old, both of them did. They did for their, their peewee teams, a little bit in the junior high, but it was something that they didn't love to do. Mm. Um, Jacob felt like he didn't have you know great talent, but he had, he had great talent in the goal. Um, and so he stuck himself there and he never had to tell him to go practice. So I said, man, let's just feed that, you know, and I never pushed him. I taught him. I said that this is what it's going to take. I'll say for my, my last guy, Joe, I used to have to tell him, Hey man, you need to go kick. You say you're going to be a varsity kicker. Well, you better get out there and kick. He wasn't kicking, Ah. you know, and it was like, dude, you ain't going to get there, but he's a plus two handicap on the golf course. Nice. Nice. You never have to tell him to go out and play golf. You never have to tell him to go out. I have a little simulator and in, in, in a net in my garage. He's always out there banging balls. Man. Oh, that's cool. So, you know, you help you find their talent. My daughter was a Division Three All-American lacrosse player. Wow. So, yeah, and she, cerebrally, she's brilliant. She's a coach up there in Philadelphia now. So sports has played a huge part in our lives. So the kicking thing didn't happen, but that doesn't discourage me because I want them to have their own Absolutely. purpose, their own identity. And if it was kicking, great. You know, that's not... Uh, to be the Peyton uh, Manning and Eli Manning and, and Archie, oh, boy, that, that's tough. But no, it didn't happen for me, but they found their way other places. Uh, that, that's neat. So you ended up staying in Baltimore, right? That's where you live yep. and that's where your kids grew up because lacrosse is so big in that, that part of the country. Yeah, and that's where PPF is, Players Philanthropy Fund. Uh, we, we got – I played till I was 42. I'm the oldest player to ever – Play in the Super Bowl and score in the Super Bowl. You still got that. So there you go. That's Brady, good. if he gets there this year, he'll get there. That's right. But uh, hopefully he won't get there. No. And uh, so, yeah, we, we made this home. And the school that they were in and the opportunity with Lacrosse World for my middle guy was incredibly important to mm-hmm. stay here. Uh, it kept us in town. And I love the town. We, we, you know, it's a great place to raise a kid. Baltimore gets a bad rap. Yeah, there are, it's a broken city just like every one of them are. Um, Art just happened to be a little bit older, and therefore it has a lot of the other issues that some don't. But I love this town. I love the people in it, and it's been a great place for me to raise my family. Oh, that's great to hear. And then the, the Ravens are, are turning the corner and had a special season and got a fun fun quarterback to watch there in town, don't you? Yeah, it was fun to watch, but I tell you, if you're the player, you go 14-2 and you don't get to the ah, Super Bowl. You're like, really? It's tough. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and I've been 13-3 and three and didn't get there. You know, so it's like, ah, oh, my. Uh, she couldn't score a touchdown against Tennessee. Are you kidding me? Oh, I know. You know, so or no, it was against Indianapolis. We couldn't score a touchdown, and there's another one against Tennessee. You know, oh gosh, don't get me going. But uh, it is, it you know, it, it's uh, to be here in Baltimore and to to be in the you know known as one of their quote celebrities, uh, you know, and football player. It, it was a lot of fun. Really uh, good stuff. That's neat. Yeah, great, great career there, and and winning the Super Bowl with them. Well, well, we'll we'll wrap up with with this. Just as you're kind of thinking about your own uh, faith journey, wh- where are you at as far as what's God teaching you? What's something that's been on your your heart most recently that that might be an encouragement to to somebody listening today? I think that mostly, Bryce, that God wants me to stay dependent on Him. Mm. Um, you know, life is really good right now. Okay, but that doesn't mean I'm not dependent on Him. Mm. Uh, every breath I take, every dollar I have. Every person I run into, um, uh, the, the pain and everything that's in this world, that God's using me, and that uh, I'm a, I am His vehicle. I'm His conduit. Uh, this life is not about me. Uh, that's why I created the Players Philanthropy Fund. I want to help people give this and athletes and people give money away more responsibly. More dollars going to the community. I do it at the cheapest level that you can do it at, I believe, for a fiscal sponsor or a donor advice fund and how we do our uh, all of our administration. Uh, so I'm not in here trying to make all this money. I'm in here trying to better and benefit our community and to do it in the right way. And, and so many people are trying to do what's right, but they just don't know how mm. and they don't they don't understand it. And they end up doing it irresponsibly, not most of the time unintentionally. So that's one of my causes, my purpose that I'm doing. But, you know, I ask God every day to put somebody in my path and just let me, God, emulate you and, and encourage. I have a gift of encouragement. And I was eating lunch with my pastor today. Mm. Didn't want anything from him. Didn't need to get counsel from him. Mm. Just needed to, you know, lift him up and say, that a boy, keep going. 
you know, pat you on the back. How's your family? Somebody that actually cared about him, mm. you know, instead of ha- having somebody he has to care about. So I think that's important. That, that's awesome. And that's a great role and an important role because because pastors don't always get that and they need that. So no. I, I, yeah. He, I didn't ask him for nothing. Hey, I, I did say, hey, preach it a little bit about what's coming up in, in, in November. But other than that, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. There you go. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, Matt, man, it's been awesome talking with you and getting a chance to, to meet you a little bit here on the Unpacking It podcast and appreciate your heart and passion and love what you're doing with the players. Philanthropy Fund and keep up the great work and, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, Bryce. And you're the one who says that the Players Philanthropy Fund the best. You've done it perfectly. <laughs> it is a tongue twister on per- purpose. It I, really is. It's so much fun. I, I had to mentally prepare. So uh, when I yeah, before, you did. You got to repeat it. That's right. That's right. Before it comes out of the mouth. So uh, so no, it's it's awesome. So keep up keep up the great work. He's Matt Stover joining us here on the Unpacking It podcast. Intriguing guests and inspiring conversations. This is Unpacking It with Bryce Johnson. Thanks to Matt Stover. What a great guy. Really cool, down-to-earth, fun guy to talk to. And you, you got to love what he was able to do You know, in the NFL, two-time Super Bowl champion. And, and so that, that, that was fun to think about that, that Ravens Super Bowl. Uh, yeah, I was, I was in middle school, and I, I'll never forget that night because, oh, yeah, Super Bowl party. I remember we had these good subs. And what did we do? At halftime, we went out and played basketball. I'm not sure we went back in. I, I, don't, I don't think we did. And that was the Michael Strahan. I think he was on that Giants team. I'm trying to think who else was on that, that Giants team that the, the Ravens beat. But um, that was a, a big win for the Ravens. So – uh, man, that was a long time ago, but, but good to catch up with Matt Stover. And the, the one big takeaway from the conversation is when he talked about, you know, after his playing career, he could have very easily gone out and he talked about writing a book and speaking and, and sharing his faith, maybe on a, a larger scale and, and leveraging his, you know, recent playing days. And, and many players do that. And it's great. But I appreciate what he said, where his role at that time was to be a husband and father, and he needed to be home. And he felt at peace about that, knew that that's what, what he needed to do for, for himself. And, and so the, the challenge to, to me as well, you know, I love leading Unpacking It Ministries, and we've got so many opportunities, so many cool things we're doing, podcasts, devotionals, events, all these different partnerships that... that we can explore, do explore, and, and there are a lot of things we just can't get to yet because we don't have time. But, but I am a new dad, and I talk a lot about that on this show, and I, I've got to prioritize certain things. And, and so the, the Lord has given me a passion to share the good news of the gospel with people, and, and I want to do it, and I want to do it well, and, and I want to be able to you know, get out and, and speak. I'm speaking this Sunday at a church, and and those opportunities, you know, certain times I'll accept and, and seek them out or not seek them out. And, and it just kind of, you know, I got to be led by the Lord in that regard. But I think for all of us, we have to recognize that there is a season and there are times where we say yes a lot. And there are times where we need to say no. And it's something that's been really hard for me in my life is saying no and saying no to good things in order to pursue what's best, and in order to be obedient to the Lord. And, and there is a great responsibility for us as, as men with you know, being a husband and being a father to take those roles seriously. And it's not always about you know, the next promotion or cool stuff at work or even saying yes to every volunteer opportunity at church or other, opportun- you know, other ministries or organizations, you know, giving back to the community. Those are good things. And, of course, sharing our faith and, and in different ways, if it means speaking or writing, but, but also you know, just being in certain environments, with, with being able to do that, those are good things. But there are also seasons for that. And sometimes saying yes to every single opportunity isn't necessarily the right choice. It requires wisdom and discernment. And, and really trusting the Lord and, and trusting His power to give us the ability to say no when we need to, because He wants us to say no, because He's got a better yes 
down the line. And so now Matt Stover, his platform hasn't gone away. Actually, since he's retired, now he's tapped into all these different athletes and, he, and all these different organizations that fall or uh, funds that fall underneath the overall players philanthropy fund. And so he's, he's connected. And, and so I, I'm, I'm excited to see how God uses him at this stage of his life now that his kids are older. And so I think those are, are, are cool things to consider because a lot of times, especially when we become you know, new followers of Jesus, we, we want to go out and, and, and do as much as we can, which is good, but oftentimes we'll be, we'll be so busy, and I, I know this for myself, in the last six years of ministry, I can get so caught up in doing, doing, doing that I'm not spending the proper time with the Lord getting refueled. I'm not, I'm not pouring into key relationships in my life. I'm not taking enough time to rest. I'm not taking, I've especially not taking care of my physical health. <laughs> I'm getting choked up even saying it. <laughs> um, I need some water because I actually, I did swim this morning. So I'm trying to get back into that because I had gotten out of it for many, many years. There's a season and, and so we've got to prioritize. And, and so that was my big takeaway from Matt Stover's comments uh, that he didn't go pursue all of that right away. Uh, but hopefully now, uh, as things, you know, his life has changed. The season of life has changed. So I hope that that, that can be an encouragement to you today. And uh, man, great conversation with Matt Stover. Really appreciate you listening to the Unpacking It podcast today. We'll be back next week with more fresh interviews and really appreciate all of the support. Uh, love your emails, Bryce at unpackingit.com. Also, you can follow us on Twitter, Unpacking It. Please share this podcast if you, if you can support this ministry financially. We would greatly appreciate that as well. Until next time, I'm Bryce Johnson. I'm a sports fan who follows Jesus. I believe in the good news that he died on the cross for my sins. He was resurrected, and through faith, I have been saved by his grace. I hope that is true for you as well, and I hope you'll join me as we live life as sports fans who follow Jesus together. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for listening to the Unpacking It podcast. For more information about the show, our events, and other resources, visit unpackingit.com. That's U-N-P-A-C-K-I-N-I-T.com. We hope you are encouraged, inspired, and challenged by what you heard today. To support our show and Unpacking It Ministries with a financial gift, visit unpackingit.com slash donate. We look forward to unpacking sports, faith, and life with you again next week.